troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace. In my troubled sea My lighthouse, my lighthouse Shining in the darkness I will follow you oh, My lighthouse, my lighthouse I will trust the promise You will carry me safe to shore Good morning. Good to see all you guys here this morning. Excited to enter time of worship through song with you, declaring these truths together. That Jesus Christ is our Savior, that He is risen. He's seated on the right hand of the Father, pleading on our behalf. Let us sing to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Towards the 
finish line, I'm not alone. No turning back. I look ahead to Jesus Christ, my own.
heaven when victory is won may i reach heaven's joys oh bright heaven sun heart of my own heart whatever befall still be my vision oh Would you awaken our hearts this morning to the wonder and glory and beauty of who you are, that it would produce in us a radical spirituality. There's not love in word and talk alone, but in deed and truth, that our thoughts and desires and actions would have roots in the faith that we confess here this morning. Lord, would you do that work in us by the power of your Holy Spirit to change us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Kids, you may be dismissed to CPK. See you guys later. said uh we'll we'll work on bringing in an extra row of seats next sunday because this auditorium is is pretty full uh and then i was reminded that uh as jesus loves to do in the gospel accounts right as he draws a crowd he's like i got some other things to say too and then he just shrinks the thing so uh we'll see because this is a pretty heavy passage of scripture that we're gonna dive into this morning but that's one of the things I love about this church is we don't just skirt the difficult passages and just kind of work our way around them as, as some sort of bypass, but rather uh, we just, where, where we are next, that's where we're going. And so uh, with that said, I invite you to open up your Bible to Luke chapter 11. Uh, we're still in Luke 11. We've been there for a few weeks. We're getting close to closing out this this chapter and, and moving on into the next one. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, you can track behind me up on the screen. This morning's passage will be up there as we work our way through it, along with other passages of Scripture that may be referenced elsewhere in God's Word. Let me, let me go ahead and pray for us, because we got a little bit more ground to cover than, than usual this morning, and we'll jump in and get to work. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning giving thanks for your word, for all of your word, not just the feel-good verses and passages, but the fullness of the canon of Scripture, your gift to us, that we might not be left with human speculation because we have divine revelation sitting right before us. We have the red letters of Jesus this morning. And so, Lord, I pray that be it for the first time, the hundredth time, the thousandth time, that you would awaken our hearts to receive that which you have for us in your word this morning, that you would open our eyes to see what's there, that you would open our ears to hear your teaching, Jesus, and that ultimately we would walk away grateful for the cross and empty tomb, and that we would walk away with a feeling sense of empowerment by your Holy Spirit that, that we can embrace the ethic of your kingdom by your grace. We could put that on display, that we could live that out 
the more glorious way in contrast to the way, Jesus, that you're going to reveal to us this morning. And so, uh, would you do these things, Spirit of God, would you move in this place that we might walk away transformed, that you might get the glory and that the joy and good might be ours. It's in your name, King Jesus, I pray as we sit with your words this morning. Amen. So Luke's gospel account. You, you see a number of, of stories of Jesus seated around the table sharing a meal with people of all different kinds of, of backgrounds. In fact, it's such a recurrence in the book of Luke that a book's been written about these various table gatherings. A book entitled A Meal with Jesus by Tim Chester. If you've never read it, I'd commend it to you. It, it's an incredible book. It, it'll make you want to open up your home and your table to people more often than you probably do now. Even if you're already one of those people that says, come on in. It'll make you want to just storm the, the gates of other people's homes and, and sit around their tables as well. It's incredibly encouraging. Many of you know that experience to sit around the table and to share a meal. Uh, this past weekend, these past few days, once a year, I have a reunion weekend where I'll gather with nine other guy friends of mine. When we can all make it, there's 10 of us, and uh, we've been doing it for 16 years now, I think. And one of the sweetest moments every time we do that is when we're able to get around a table that, that seats 10 and just share a meal and, and watch the conversation unfold to the glory of God. By God's grace, uh, we're all Christians. We didn't start off that way, uh, but that is true now. And so all the sweeter is the conversation that we have with, with Christ uniting us together. And, and many of you know th those experiences. Uh, you, you can go back to some of your, your greatest memories in life and recall that you were probably sitting around a table uh, over a shared meal. That's something of the essence of the book of Luke. You see it on repeat. Up to this point in Luke's gospel account, we've seen uh, on one account, Jesus in the presence of a large company of sinners and tax collectors gathered for a great feast in the home of Levi, going back to chapter 5. You may recall in that instance that the scribes and their Pharisees grumbled at Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Not only were Levi and his friends considered ceremonially unclean, close proximity to them, a fast track to defilement, but to share a meal with such people was a sign of acceptance, of identification, of friendship, of brotherhood. In that particular instance, with societies disreputable, Jesus may have as well have been seated at a table of lepers, as far as the scribes and Pharisees were concerned. It made no sense to those who perceive themselves to be righteous in the economy of God. And Jesus, as we saw, took that opportunity to leverage the criticism of the religious elite into a mission statement. You remember he answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. A seat at the table of forgiveness offered for those who will acknowledge their sin, abandon themselves, and turn to Jesus in faith. And let's not forget the gathering around the table of Simon the Pharisee, going back to chapter 7, where a woman believed by many scholars to have been a town prostitute showed up uninvited and fell at the feet of Jesus, kissing his feet and wiping them with her hair. An act considered incredibly scandalous among respectable women in Jesus' day. More than that, you'll recall, she took an alabaster flask of perfumed oil that she had in her possession and poured the oil on Jesus' feet. An incredible act of not only sacrifice, but humility. As such an anointing was typically re reserved for a person's head. She was caught up in a moment of worship, pouring out not only her perfume, but her heart. To which Simon responded by concluding that Jesus must not even be a prophet, much less the coming Messiah. After all, any good prophet would refuse to allow such a sinner to come within arm's length. In that particular situation, Luke presenting us with two contrasting responses to Jesus, two very different understandings of sin and grace. A forgiven sinner overwhelmed with extravagant love and a self-righteous man overwhelmed with inconsiderate contempt. Luke's been doing that all along, right? There is no third option. There is no uh, option of neutrality. It's one way or the other. Something significant always seems to happen when we find Jesus participating in a meal. And that's, that's surely true of this morning's passage. Going back to last week, uh, Jesus has just declared himself to be God's greatest sign. Pronouncing judgment upon those who would fail to repent and trust in him. And with that, declaring that there are two kinds of people. 
in the presence of a number of scribes and Pharisees, mind you, those with healthy eyes, so to speak, and those with bad eyes. The first of the two, healthy eyes, meaning literally without folds, referring to a single undivided focus. In other words, not having a hidden duplicitous agenda. The second of the two, bad eyes, meaning just the opposite, duplicitous, hypocritical. It's within that context we pick up the story in verse 37 where Jesus was speaking. And as he was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. And so he went in and reclined at table. And the Pharisee was astonished to see that Jesus did not first wash before dinner. Here we go again. Jesus finds himself in the home of a Pharisee, a man like Simon, astonished at Jesus. In this case, not for allowing a sinful woman to anoint his feet, but for failing to wash his hands. And it wasn't so much a a hygiene issue, mind you, but rather a man-made rule for the purposes of, of ceremonial purity. Meaning that the religious leaders would would wash their hands before eating in order to remove the dirtiness associated with having come in contact with the world. The Mishnah, uh, the first major recorded collection of Jewish oral traditions, that writing gives gives some indication uh, to what such a washing may have been like. Listen to these words. The hands are susceptible to uncleanness, and they are rendered clean by the pouring over them of water up to the wrist. Thus, if a man had poured the first water up to the wrist and the second water beyond the wrist, and the water flowed back to the hand, the hand becomes clean. But if he poured both the first water and the second beyond the wrist, and the water flowed back to the hand, the hand remains unclean. If he poured the first water over the one hand alone, and he bethought himself and poured the second water over the one hand, his one hand alone is clean. If he had poured the water over the one hand and rubbed it on the other, it becomes unclean. But... If he rubbed it on his head or on the wall to dry it, it remains clean. Can we all agree that we're talking about some incredibly tedious hand washing here? I mean, this makes what, whatever your, your rule system during COVID for sanitation, whatever that's looked like, this is a whole nother level right here. Right, Jesus knows exactly what he's doing in choosing not to participate in this ritual. A decision that, that astonishes the Pharisee, to say the least. I mean, the man surprised to see Jesus, a Jewish man of religious influence, fail to wash his hands, an act of defilement in the mind of the Pharisee on Jesus' part. Like Jesus' association with Levi and his friends, chapter 5. Like Jesus' welcoming of the sinful woman into the house of Simon, chapter 7. And here's Jesus' response, verse 39. The Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give his alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. Many of us know this, the, the scribes and Pharisees were seen as models of virtue. The word Pharisee itself meaning separatist. They'd established this this code of morals and regulations that went far beyond the scriptures, more rigid than the law of Moses. We just saw one example of that. As I've mentioned before, referred to by Sally Lloyd-Jones in the Jesus Storybook Bible as the extra super holy people. So that most people believe they'd never be that righteous. They'd never measure up. The Pharisees standing in their own minds on one of the, the higher rungs of God's great ladder... So high up in the clouds of their own self-righteousness that the only direction to look was down on other people. Unable to see their great need. Perceiving themselves to be the ones with healthy eyes in the eyes of God. And yet here Jesus exposes their hypocrisy. Declaring that their hearts are full of greed. Full of wickedness. Jesus says things externally appear to be in order but, but on the inside is death and decay. So that Your hearts are just as sinful and unacceptable to God as anyone else. Even the imagery there. You you ever put leftovers in a Tupperware and accidentally let them get to the back of the shelf on the fridge only to find them several weeks later? Everything looks good on the outside, but the minute you crack that lid, the stench of death, right? That's the imagery that Jesus gives. Clean hands, outward piety, yes and amen. Amen. Clean hearts, inward piety, no way. 
We see it in the parallel account, Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 through 9, where Jesus says, <clears throat> You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, <clears throat> excuse me, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. God sees both the lips and the heart. He cares about both. He created both. Coming back to this morning's passage, verse 40. Jesus says, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? And in saying that, Jesus calls the Pharisees to give as alms those things that are within, verse 41. Meaning to give up their greed. To give up their wickedness and repentance. To turn from their sin. Not, not at an external level alone, but to inwardly repent of heart level sin and unbelief. The heart being the soil out, out of which the fruit of God glorifying obedience is actually born. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Psalm 24 verse 3. He who has clean hands, yes and amen, and a pure heart. Jesus goes on, and I'll warn you, it only gets heavier. He says, but woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Jesus continues now with this series of woes. We're going to see six of them before he's all said and done. The word woe, not so much meaning a threat, but rather an expressed grief or sorrow. The Pharisees, they were scrupulously fixated on certain aspects of obedience down to the tithing of the most insignificant of herbs. Even going beyond what the Mosaic law required at times, all the while missing the weightier matters, Jesus says, of justice and the love of God. Coming back to Micah chapter 6 verse 8, one of the more famous passages in the Old Testament. says, he has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. It's one of the most well-known Old Testament summaries of godly living. It's another way of saying love God and neighbor, right? The two commandments on which all the law and the prophets uh, depend. Matthew chapter 22, verse 40. I mean, the Pharisees, they, they had their tithing down to the dollars and decimals. Make no mistake about it. And yet they had managed to miss the law's heart-piercing demands by way of their insulated rules. And with that, a failure, a failure to truly love God from the heart. And in addition, we've already seen this in Luke's gospel account, they had failed to embrace the heart of the good Samaritan in welcoming strangers, in caring for widows and orphans, in helping those in need. Jesus continues, verse 43 Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seed in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Now you begin to see why it would make sense that the Pharisees focused a great deal on the outward, as they cared a great deal about appearances before other people. Having made public recognition and self-praise the, the motivations of their religious practice. They loved the best seed in the synagogues, the ones that faced the congregation bringing any person who sat there into prominent view. They loved greetings in the marketplaces, the, the public recognition associated with being a person of respect in the religious community, the love of self in contrast with the love for God and, and neighbor. He goes on, verse 44, Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. Right, this might be the greatest insult of all right here. To come in contact with the grave in Jesus' day was to, to jeopardize ritual purity, to make oneself unclean, which made the marking of graves all the more important in keeping a person from walking right over a grave unaware, hence the whitewashing of tombs. You're like an unmarked grave, says Jesus to the Pharisees thinking highly of yourselves and your perceived righteousness, and yet you're completely unaware that not only are you unclean, but beyond unclean, you're dead inside. And more than that, as if that weren't hard enough to hear, you lead others to the pit of death along with you as they unknowingly walk over your teaching like an unmarked grave. How much of that has happened in the Bible Belt American South? My goodness. 
Strong words to say the least. Words which apparently offended uh, more than just the Pharisees who were present. Because we're told, verse 45, one of the lawyers answered him, one of the scribes, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. A lawyer, we've talked about this before in this series, was one well-versed in the law, an expert in the law of Moses, like the, the man who stood up to put Jesus to the test, going back to chapter 10, to whom Jesus responded with that parable of the Good Samaritan. In contrasting the, the scribes and Pharisees, Kent Hughes in his commentary, I think this is helpful. He says, the Pharisees were religionists, members of a religious party that enforced the legal code. The lawyers scribes or experts in the law the three terms being interchangeable were the codifiers of the law the people who built hedges around it by encrusting it with myriads of extra regulations jesus's woes to the pharisees were swipes at their hi hypocritical religious practices whereas the woes that fell on the lawyers had to do with the way they abused the torah god's word here a lawyer declares his, his own feeling sense of insult in close association with the Pharisees whom Jesus has just indicted. Presenting Jesus with an opportunity to say, oh, I, I didn't mean you guys. And yet what does Jesus say? Verse 46, woe to you lawyers also. Get in on the party, boys. For you load people with burdens hard to bear and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Remember, we've just seen the finger of God in the casting out of a demon, for contrast. Lawyers or scribes, they were notorious for, for heaping their traditions and interpretations of the law on others, creating an unbearable burden for people. For example, we talked about this back in chapter 6. Uh, they had established 39 major categories of labor that were forbidden on the Sabbath, with hundreds of subcategories underneath those 39 major categories. And not only were certain acts forbidden, but also anything resembling a forbidden act or anything that could be confused with a forbidden act. They saw the plucking of grain as a form of reaping on the Sabbath. And the rubbing of grain between a person's fingers as a form of threshing. You have this contrast of a, of a captive man possessed by a demon being set free from his bondage. And here, this imagery of people being loaded with unbearable burdens all the while being left underneath the weight of those burdens no help from the religious leaders in contrast jesus says and many of you know these words matthew eleven twenty eight, 28 come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. It's an invitation on Jesus' part to those burdened with the traditions of the scribes and the Pharisees, along with their burdensome interpretations of the law. I'd ask this morning, is there anyone here laboring? Anyone here heavy laden, bearing the yoke of burdensome traditions and man-made religious expectations? Jesus says, come to me. That's an invitation. Come to me and I will give you rest. He goes on with the scribes, with the lawyers. Verse 47, woe to you for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses and you consent to the deeds of your fathers for they killed them and you build their tombs. Another way of saying, you're just like your fathers, you finish what they started. Hearts far from God, guilty of greed, hypocrisy, and pride. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, so to speak. Your fathers killed the prophets, those whose writings spoke of a promised Messiah. And you continue in their bloodshed as you seek to kill the one of whom the prophet spoke. He goes on to unpack that further in verse 49. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, that's the entirety of the Old Testament, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, Jesus says, it will be required of this generation 
Some believe that Jesus here quotes a book outside the canon of Scripture with others believing he's simply saying something to the effect of this is in accordance with God's wisdom. In favor of the second of those two views uh, is the fact that Jesus speaks these words as his own words in Matthew chapter 23, verse 34. Either way, Jesus makes plain that, that God has commissioned people through the ages to proclaim his word, to reveal his will. Prophets and apostles, some of whom were persecuted and killed. And, and with that, Jesus declares in strong language that the lawyers in his day, the scribes, are not on the side of the martyrs, but rather the side of the persecutors and the murderers. The blood is on your hands, Jesus says. You who fail to repent like the Ninevites, going back to last week. Again, guilty not only for the bloodshed of Jesus himself, but the prophets who came before him. As those prophets testified about Jesus, the promised Messiah. Going back to last week, the light of the world was standing right in front of them. The radiance of the glory of God. One greater than Solomon. One greater than Jonah. The fulfillment of the writings of the prophets of old. And no different than their fathers, they were out for blood. Makes sense that Isaiah 53 would tell us that Jesus was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. In the words of one commentator, the religious leaders of Jesus' day represent the culmination of Israel's rebellion against God. Stakes are high in rejecting God's promised Messiah. He continues, verse 52. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. The Pharisees, if they thought highly of themselves and their perceived righteousness, and yet were leading others to the pit of, of death, unmarked graves that they were, then likewise the, the lawyers, who thought highly of their interpretation of the law, were not only misinformed themselves as well, but they were leading others away from a right understanding of the knowledge of God. As Jesus said back in verse 23, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. The lawyers were scattering people away from God, the religious leaders, driving them away from the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Maybe the most sobering part of this passage for me personally and considering the implications of expounding the scriptures to again quote Kent Hughes he says preaching is not exposition if it views the text through the lens of a personal agenda we must free the word from our scribal accretions be they ever so evangelical and let God's word say what it says that's why we don't skip past passages like last week where we celebrated the wonder of the miracle of illumination that we see and savor Jesus Christ for who he truly is and move right around the woes to the scribes and Pharisees because that's a weighty hard passage. No, it's all God's word. My aim is to let God's word as best I can say what it says. To heed the words of the Apostle Paul, 2 Timothy 2.15 do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. Here it is, rightly handling the word of truth. It's one of our great aims is to equip a people who know when they hear the word and when they don't. A people who, who know when they hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and when they don't. Who know that we enter through him to use that imagery of Jesus' language here. That he's the key to our salvation. That our hope is in the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Verse 53 this probably comes as no surprise to any of us who have read the gospel accounts before. As he went away from there, Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard. And to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. Shocker of the century, right? The scribes and Pharisees, they're not happy with Jesus. They've just been rebuked and insulted. Committing themselves now all the more to teaming up with each other in an effort to trap Jesus. Uh, and getting him to say something incriminating that they can use against him. It's a foreshadowing. 
of the cross to come. Jesus has already predicted it. Luke chapter 9, verse 22. Again, as their fathers had persecuted and killed the prophets of old, so they sought to persecute and destroy the fulfillment of the prophets of old. Irony of ironies to their own destruction. This morning's passage, it's incredibly sobering if we're hearing it rightly. As Jesus invites us to sit with a number of diagnostic questions. Am I more concerned with outward appearances than inward godliness? Or another way to ask it, am I as holy on the inside as I'd like for people to think I am on the outside? Am I committed to checking certain religious boxes scrupulously, all the while missing the weightier matters of love for God and neighbor? Am I concerned with status and reputation above concern for others? Yearning for people to notice my spiritual or religious accomplishments. I mean, how, how are we res- to respond to these hard words of Jesus? Which offend our self-righteousness and pride. Well, I think it's fair to say, and Luke has gone to painstaking lengths again to make this clear. There are only two responses. Like the scribes and Pharisees, we can... Reject Jesus in anger. And we will do so to our own destruction. Or we can respond as the prophet Isaiah did. That might seem like a really strange place to go in closing our time in the scriptures this morning. The book of Isaiah? Really? But if you go to Isaiah, many of us are very famous with chapter 6. Isaiah before the enthronement of God. But if you look at the chapter before that, you see the inclusion of the pronouncement of six woes against the wickedness and sin of God's people, similar to this morning's passage. In the scriptures, things typically don't come in sixes. They typically come in sevens. So where's the seventh woe? Well, in the book of Isaiah, it comes from Isaiah's very own mouth in the very next chapter, that chapter that we know so well, chapter 6. Where Isaiah declares, woe is me, for I am lost, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah was, was in a staring contest with a brightness more intense than the sun. The brightness of God's holiness, the brightness of God's glory. And it left him absolutely undone. Down to the best part of him. Right? Think about this. Isaiah was appointed to be a prophet. His tongue consecrated to God. That which he could have regarded as most sacred was his mouth. And yet, what does he declare? I'm a man of unclean lips. It's a declaration of the totality of his sinful state. If you're not a Christian, similarly... You've been brought face to face with the king through our time in the scriptures this morning. The Lord of hosts, Jesus Christ. I pray that you're undone by our time in God's word. That you're brought to the end of yourself. That you'd see where this story's headed. That Jesus would go on to live the perfect life that you and I could never live. That he would go on to die the death that we deserve to die for our self-righteousness. For our hypocrisy. That you would see Jesus taking the woe of your sin upon himself at Calvary. Only Jesus. He's the only one who can change a person from the inside out. Replacing the heart of stone with the heart of flesh. Ezekiel 36. The appropriate response to Jesus is not to take offense. But rather to repent of your sins and to trust in him for salvation. To cry out, woe is me, Lord. Like Isaiah, I'm unclean. Only in Jesus can I be made clean. Son of David, have mercy on me. And if you are a Christian, my prayer is that the the kindness of the Lord would lead us to repentance. That we might turn from greed, self-righteousness, hypocrisy, and pride. That we would acknowledge that, unlike the scribes and the Pharisees, we have nothing to prove. We have no need for public recognition, the praises of man. 
You will never see two chairs up here facing this congregation as long as I'm pastoring this church. It's not about us. We belong to Jesus. We exist for the glory of the one who's redeemed us. It's about him. The one who took the woe of our sin upon himself. To him be the praise, not to us. Praise Jesus for the cross, amen? That we might be forgiven of our hypocrisy. As we sing, sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow from the inside out. Praise him for the indwelling Holy Spirit, Christian, who empowers us to put those sins of greed to death, those sins of self-righteousness and hypocrisy and pride. That by God's grace, we can actually give everything within us as alms. And that can be a beautiful thing as we continue to see Jesus plant his uh, flag of kingship deeper in our lives. It's the better way. It's been purchased for us in him. J.C. Ryle says in his commentary, Let us leave this passage with a settled determination to watch and pray against hypocrisy in religion. Whatever we are as Christians, let us be real, thorough, genuine, and sincere. Let us abhor all affectation and part acting or play acting in the things of God as that which is utterly loathsome in Christ's eyes. We may be weak and erring and frail and come far short of our aims and desires, he says. But at any rate, if we profess to believe in Christ, let us be true. As John Calvin once famously prayed, I offer you my heart, Lord, promptly and sincerely. May that be the prayer of this church as we, as we submit ourselves to the lordship of our Savior and King, Jesus Christ. That, that's what the world needs to see. A sincere church. A genuine church. A true church that makes much, not of itself, but the glory of our risen Savior and King. Let me pray for us that God would do that great work in us by his grace and his indwelling power. We'll continue to worship together through our song. It's an opportunity to, to put that into practice. To say we're not here to glorify ourselves, Lord. We didn't come into this place beating our chest. Look at me. Look at how religiously impressive I am. No, we came to give you praise. We get to do that with our lips, with our song. And so I invite you to do that. And to acknowledge as you do that I'm here for your glory, Lord. We also have an opportunity to worship through the receiving of the Lord's Supper. If you're a Christian, that meal is for you. If you missed it on your way in, there are communion cups on the back table there. You're welcome to go grab one of those during these last few songs. We take the, the bread representing the broken body of Jesus and dip it in the cup representing his shed blood. You can do that at any point along the way between now and the end of this service. I don't see any way that that meal wouldn't be sweet for us this morning. I mean, one, it's, it's, a, it's an acknowledgement that the contrast between what's on the outside and the inside and our desperate need for the broken body and shed blood of Jesus, it's, it's right there in front of us in the scriptures this morning. Hallelujah, again, praise God for Calvary. But it's also a, an opportunity to Share a meal together. Coming back to the first thing I said, that some of the sweetest things happen around the table. And metaphorically speaking, we sit around the table together every time we come into this place and partake of the Lord's Supper. And, and so in, in some sense, it's a continuation of all those moments we see in Luke's gospel account. And a foreshadowing of the marriage supper of the Lamb to come. The greatest meal that we will participate in together uh, that, that awaits us. Let's pray and, and let's, let's worship Jesus through a shared meal and a shared song together. Jesus, thank you for the honesty of your words. I think it would be fair to say, and I, I think I could speak for most of us in this room, if not all of us, that if, if we were writing uh, an account of your person, your work, your ministry, we, we might very likely be inclined to leave some of the hard words out to present a feel-good experience and message from start to finish. But, but how, uh, 
how deluded the good news would be for not having sat with the reality and the weight of the bad news that drives us to the cross, Calvary. Thank you for taking the woe of our sin upon yourself. Lord, I pray that if there be any in this room this morning uh, who perhaps came into this place without a saving knowledge of, of Jesus, without a personal trust in Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would awaken their hearts, you would perform the great work of regeneration, that they might cry out in faith and in trust, like Isaiah, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. And Lord, thank you for those of us who are in Christ, that, Lord, we can come to you, your kindness leading us to repentance. We can cry out, asking you to continue to plant your flag of kingship deeper in our hearts, taking ground that we might be transformed all the more from the inside out. We've already been positionally declared to be clean in Christ, and now for the rest of our lives, becoming what we've already been positionally declared to be in the functional sense. Lord, would you do that? It's the better way. Lord, I pray that this church would be a beacon of light that would shine differently than than whatever that expression that looks a lot like the scribes and Pharisees that's found its roots in, in our cultural context, in our day and age. Lord, I pray that we would be different, not only for our own good and for your glory, but that the light that we shine would cause others to, to praise you, our Father, who's in heaven. That more people might come to to know you and love you, Jesus, because they see this salt and light community that's different. We're desperate for your grace, if it is to happen, for the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit to work. So we ask, we petition boldly, repetitively. This won't be the last time I pray those words, nor will it be the last time that many of my brothers and sisters pray those words. Would you do it, Lord? Would you move, would you work in our lives and in our hearts to change us, to transform us from within? Because of the cross and empty tomb, we believe it's possible. We know it's possible. And we know that you will do it for those of us who are united to you by faith. We love you. We worship you now. It's for your glory that we sing. In Jesus' name, amen. You stand back up with me as we respond to God's word, declaring that we are washed clean by the spotless blood of the Lamb. That is the good news. That is once and for all as Christians, but it also is ongoing as He sanctifies us by the work of the Holy Spirit as we walk in repentance as he makes us pure let's sing that Lord
Go out singing this song. Lord, it is our prayer. That increasingly you would plant your flags of dominion on our hearts. That we would decrease and that you might increase in our lives. And that you would continue to transform us into the likeness of yourself. Oh, the joy. things as we get ready to close out our time here this morning. Uh, just a, a few announcements really quickly. Uh, one, uh, if you're not on a serving team on Sunday mornings, uh, we do have some, some needs, uh, some, some spaces that we need to uh, connect people into. Uh, particularly top of the list would be our connect team right now. Uh, and then with that as well, kids ministry, uh, AV, you know, audio visual stuff. Um, we're, we're always trying to build a team and not just have enough people, but even a, a surplus uh, that we can um, work with and, and just continue to build out a healthiness in those teams. So if that's something that you're interested in and able to engage, uh, there are serving team cards on the back table. You can fill one of those out and drop it in the offering box and we'll get connected with you uh, as an outworking if you're having filled out that card. A couple more things. Uh, partnership course, we are going to have the next one of those on November 20th. It's a Saturday morning from 8 to noon. We'll provide breakfast and coffee. It's a one-stop shop. We'll knock out all of the content associated with partnership uh, in one gathering as opposed to breaking it up into several weeks. And so uh, if, if you're not uh, a member of our church and you'd like to explore church membership with us, uh, you can engage in that time with us. Tomorrow morning, I'll be sending out a registration page for that. 
Uh, and that includes those of you who filled out the survey um, as well as everyone else. We just ask for you to respond to that so we can capture everyone together and kind of know what the head count's going to be for that so we can provide enough food and coffee to keep you awake and full for the entirety of that time. The last announcement before we move to the benediction and scatter as the church this week would be uh, as an outworking, a, a practicing of what we see in the book of Luke as people gather around uh, the table together for a shared meal. Uh, this week, uh, in God's providence, happens to be the family dinner rhythm of community groups. And so our groups, we do different things on different weeks, depending on uh, which week uh, things tend to fall. And so this upcoming week for our groups, uh, including today and on through Wednesday, we have groups that meet Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. All of those groups will be gathering for a family uh, dinner this week. So you can put into practice what you see, uh, the essence of in the book of Luke, and really the essence of a foreshadowing, again, of what we're going to see uh, at the Marriage Supper of the Lamb to come. So uh, if you're not a part of a community group, uh, this would be a great week to explore that. It's a good on-ramp, those family dinner rhythms. Again, you can fill out a card in the back uh, for community groups and drop that in the offering box. And, and uh, we will uh, at least have four hearty meals happening around tables or kitchen islands, right? That's the modern application, I guess, of Scripture. Gather around the kitchen island in, in the name of Christ. So with that said, the benediction this morning as we close out this time is this. May God give you the grace to be honest, genuine, and true as you offer your heart to Him promptly and sincerely, the one who took the woe of your sin upon Himself. Go and be the sincere church for the glory of God. Love you guys.